Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Once again, I so appreciate you giving me a bit of your time every week. With me today is Jessica Guthrie. She is the Caregiver Career Collide account on Instagram. If you're not following her there, you need to be. But we're going to talk about what her story and what it's like to be a single, young, millennial caregiver, try to maintain a career and take care of her mom. So thanks for joining me, Jessica. Of course. Thanks for having me. So give everybody your background. You can tell us about yourself and then your mom. And then I have like a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Guthrie. As she said, I am a young millennial caregiver of my mother who is living with Alzheimer's disease. I am currently at the time of this recording, 34 years old, um, and became a caregiver of my mom around the age of 25. I am an only child, and so I grew up uh, with my mom, who was a single mother, and I would say that my life growing up was just me and my mom. Um, every recital, every competition, every every presentation, my mom was there. Um, and if she wasn't there, she spent the hours on the front end doing my hair and making sure I was ready to go. Um, and so my mom has truly played such an influential part in my growing up um, that I knew that I had no other choice but to take care of her the way that she cared for me. So in terms of Jessica, I, um, for the past 10 years, have worked for an education nonprofit uh, where I help support, train, and develop young leaders who are stepping into um, our nation's classrooms in, across urban and rural areas. And while doing that, I realize that my passion is truly in um, educating others. Um, and now that I've been a caregiver for seven years. I'm now moving that passion into educating other adults into what does it mean to be an effective and thoughtful caregiver. So I'll stop there. <laughs> That's true. Then you do that quite well. Um, even my husband, if he sees me following your story or watching your story, sometimes he'll be like, oh, what's up with Jessica or how's Jessica doing <laughs> today? <laughs> so just a little hot back behind the, yes, behind the scenes of what happens around here. Um, <laughs> you know, he's obviously very supportive of what I do and anybody that is on my radar is generally on his. So mm. it's, it's been interesting. And I forget that my mom started showing signs of Alzheimer's when I was 32. Wow. Mostly probably because my daughter was like, maybe, no, my daughter was two, which made me, I'm sorry, 27, Lord. So I was only a little bit older than you, but I didn't start taking care of her in the traditional sense. I basically started covering for her issues mm. at work. Mm -hmm. and But I forget because it became just such a natural part of life, you mm -hmm. know, to, to deal with situations that were bizarre and clients that would call up and drop F-bombs because my mom constantly screwed their stuff up. It was just, that's just how it was until yeah. my dad passed away. So you've been with your company since before caregiving became mm -hmm. a priority in your life. Mm -hmm. How many years was it while you were caregiving that you were not vocal about what was going on? Because I know that's really common. People don't want to tell their employers that they're taking care of their parent or grandparent or spouse because they're afraid they'll get sidelined from promotions or seen as less dedicated, you know, all the negative things. So, mm -hmm. how, so I'm assuming you didn't say things in the beginning and that was maybe one of the reasons protecting your mom's dignity was probably the other one. Yes and no. So it's I, I actually have a pretty interesting story here. So my I worked for education nonprofit. We are driven by social justice, equity, um, racial equity, um, and ensuring that every single child gets the opportunity to an equitable education, right? And so I named that because my organization was a pretty um, we were in startup mode 
my region was, um, we were really close and I was someone who leaned on my colleagues, my own boss and the people around me very much um, to, to navigate this time. So in 20, I want to say 2015, we were at a staff retreat. And at that staff retreat, I got a phone call from my mother's principal because my mom worked in the education system. And at that retreat on that phone call, he said, Jessica, what's wrong with your mother? And, you know, I worked in education, too. So I was like, you never tell the principal what's really going on. Like you try to cover this up, you know. Um, But then it got to the point where he was naming the things that was happening. She was forgetting to pick the kids up. She was, you know, missing. like things that she had been doing for the past 18 years. Um, She wasn't arriving on time to her, to her different posts, things like that. And I was like, you know, principal so-and-so, my mother um, has early onset Alzheimer's. And he basically said, well, she can no longer, he, he said without saying it, she can no longer work here. And you could tell, I mean, she'd been there for 18 years. She had like been a staple of her school. So he didn't want to fire her. Um, And I'll never forget hanging up the phone and running to like this small little closet at our retreat space and my direct boss and then our executive director, they were in that room with me while I completely broke down crying because I was like, I don't know what to do. My mother like isn't going to have a job. Like, what does this mean for me? Like I just all the questions and the stuff that floods over you. And at this point, 25 years old, like I don't know what to do. And they were the ones that held my hand as I navigated um, just like the, my reaction to that phone call. I start there because I would say I'm probably not the norm. They knew this really big like moment from the very beginning. I would say the things that I didn't share was like with my colleagues about how stressful things were becoming for me or, you know, how I would have, you know, late nights battling insomnia because I was so exhausted and stressed for how to like figure out what my next steps were going to be or trying to travel back and forth. Um, But my organization, I would say, has been supportive of me from day one. Everything from filling in for me for major conferences, from paying for my flights home, um, back and forth between where I was working in Texas to home, to really making sure that I took advantage of the benefits. Like I, I would not be where I am today if I didn't have the support of the people that I worked with, particularly my boss um, and those around her. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's totally awesome to hear because that's where we need all organizations and all companies and universities, et cetera. Sure. I'm missing a group. That's where we need them all to be. And we need them all to be there like yesterday, because as you know, the, uh, the population is aging, you know, for better mm-hmm. or worse. You know, my listeners know that my paternal grandmother lived to 103. Honoriness runs in the family. So I've got like 47 years to go. So, you know, you guys got to put up with me for a few more years. <laughs> and it's, it's just a fact of life. We're not the mm-hmm. only nation facing an aging population, but mm-hmm. we don't have the, we did not have any sort of system to help with this problem that is just mm-hmm. it's right now it's kind of hiding in the dark that it's going to burst forth and people are going to be like what the hell do we do yep and yep. some of us will be like we've been telling you for a decade yep <laughs> what yep. we need what you need to do mm-hmm. and one of my suggestions that i got actually this guest was talking we were supposed to talk on one topic and he went off like on a whole other much i think more interesting i hope it's more interesting because that's where we went <laughs> conversation And while he was talking, I'm like, you know, it would be so simple if when a loved one is diagnosed that the medical profession, because we know they can't do very much for them, says, oh, my gosh, your mother has early onset Alzheimer's, which is what my mom also had. Um, We're going to we're going to immediately enroll you in palliative care. And this is what palliative care is going to do. And of course, you know, being the society that America is, people would be like, but the expense. Yes. Well, I personally think it would keep a lot of people out of the doctors, out of the hospital, off the hotlines. You know, just I think it would pay for itself. Mm -hmm. I think the cost saved in one spot would pay. So, yeah, I've, I've had a shift in my my thinking I do a lot of stuff with the Alzheimer's Association and I seriously think 
there's a big part of me that's like, the research's not getting us anywhere. We need to take care of all the people that are living with this situation now and their families. Mm -hmm. And this comes from somebody who actually facilitates a support group. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know. We need, mm -hmm. I, I think we need a big shift. And that was one of the reasons when, you know, you agreed to talk to me. I'm like, okay, what, what do I specifically want to talk to Jessica about? Because <laughs> it's been a little while since I threw out the suggestion. And I'm like, okay, now we've talked about some of the things she and I were going to talk about, but that's fine. So what do you think companies, how can companies be more like your organization and be supportive without... The and I, I don't think it's necessarily a hundred percent accurate that obviously you've been a really good employee all these years because mm -hmm. you've moved up in the company, you're still employed, you have not been such a flake that you know they didn't want to keep you. So, how do we help companies understand what people like you and I need? I mean, I've been self employed forever, so I when I say myself, that's not really very accurate. Mm -hmm. How can mm -hmm. we get our society to start moving for, towards? helping support people like you and mm -hmm. your mom, my mom, but mm -hmm. still maintain, you know, our capitalistic society? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. Big, um, big question for you there. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. I was an excellent employee. I still am, right? Like, I think that's the first thing I'll say. This is actually not to companies. It's to anyone who's a worker is like, um, the reason why my, my team invested so much in me is because I, I did my job and did it really well. And I was so invested in my team, right? And so I started out as a manager and I'm now the vice president and chief program officer. Um, that comes with being committed, working really hard, building relationships um, and truly collaborating to get to, you know, common outcomes. And so I named that because I think that's the first thing we often forget is that like um, people invest in folks who are truly going to um, invest in you, right? Um, and so that's, that's, that's part of my story, I'll say. I think the thing is, I think my team was also a unique team, right? Like the fact that they had been on this journey from the very beginning with me, allowed them to understand my story, allowed them to have empathy, allowed them to be curious and ask questions of me versus you know, make assumptions around what they thought my caregiving situation was like. And so I think maybe that's my second piece of advice that's both to companies and employees. It's like, how often are you getting to know the people that you work with pre pre caregiving, right? Because if you don't see me as a human with things on my plate, with things that I care about, passions, visions, whatever it might be, you're not going to see me as a human when things get really hard. And I think that that was also just a benefit of working where I worked. Um, I think the third thing is, um, and granted, my team was excellent and there's still there's still a lot that they can do. Right. I think, for instance, I'm currently on caregiving leave or family care leave connected to FMLA. Our organization gives family caregivers, so non parent caregivers, um, six weeks of paid leave. Um, I would say. And if I took more than that six weeks to continue doing this family care thing, I would have to move into unpaid leave. And so a very tangible um, thing that companies can do is actually give family caregivers equitable um, time off that is paid. Birthing and non-birthing parents get 14 weeks just like that, right? I'm not saying the, jour the journeys are the same, but what I am saying is caring for an aging, a dying loved one requires the time and energy, and that's more than six weeks. So that's the first thing I would say. Well, I guess the third thing I would say. Um, and then, you know, when I think about it, too often people don't speak up or share their experiences with their workplaces because our workplaces use the most like non-inclusive language. Our workplaces very much preference the archetypal caregiving experience. Our workplaces only think about caring for kids when we talk about caregiving. And as a millennial caregiver of my mother, I have felt like an outsider too often because when it's like, oh, do you need child care? Do you like, we want to be mindful of our parents who are in the workspace. We want to be mindful that you all have pickup. And part of me is like, oh, yes, all of those things are true, but that's not the only caregiver in this workspace. And so 
a really simple shift that all companies can make is how inclusive are your policies? How inclusive is your language? Because if you don't include me in the ways in which you set up this team, this organization, I for sure am not going to tell you about the realities of what I'm holding. And I definitely don't feel like you see me. So why would I want to continue working here? That makes sense. I also see kind of a catch 22 is if they're not aware of what people are going through because a lot of caregivers don't say anything and they're not, I mean, we're definitely running the age spectrum here from someone as young as you to somebody who's at the end of their career that may have to retire early to care for a spouse. I mean, that's a big spectrum. So right there, employers should be a whole lot more attentive Mm -hmm. because it's not just going to affect maybe their older employees, but do you feel like people should speak up and, and talk to maybe a trusted colleague maybe first or mm-hmm. HR if that if mm-hmm. they feel because I know people are they're terrified that they're gonna get sidelined mm-hmm. or they're you know or they're gonna have to quit completely because mm-hmm. they don't have inclusive policies. So how yeah. do we get how do we get past this catch 22 here? Yeah, I mean I think honestly companies and organizations should have something built into their human resources department so that they, one, people feel like there's a confidential place to share, a non-judgmental place to share. I think the piece that's missing is like, how do we equip managers and our company leaders with like basic, this is going to sound worse than what I mean, but basic empathy skills, right? Like, The thing that turns people off, sure, is the fear of all the things happening to them. But if I engage in a conversation with you and it doesn't feel like you are listening to me, you you care about what's happening, I for sure am not going to say anything. And I think that's too often because of lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, people's like managers' responses are not what people need at the time. I think about people who you know, are navigating this right now, they'll email their, their managers and they get the most cold hearted response back. And you're like, wait a second, I'm not a robot. I'm not a widget. (laughs) I'm someone who's carrying something real. And so I I mean, honestly, that's what I would also say. The other point of your like double-edged sword is how do we help? And I mean, there might be some generational differences here, but like the reality is how do we, Mm. how do we see people not as like people creating products or getting to an outcome, but as whole human beings doing the work? And the reality here is that, you know, I will do better work. I will actually show up if you reduce my hours by, you know, five hours a week and let me work from home. And like do excellent work versus you forcing me to be in the office, do all of these things. And so part of me is like, that only happens when we recognize that people have whole human lives that they're carrying and walking in with. And I think that 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 mindset shift, it's not a policy, it's not a practice, it's just that mindset shift will go a long way. I think in some companies, it actually is a policy shift because my husband prior to being a real estate broker for almost 20 years, God, I don't know how, I don't know how we get this old, <laughs> was in banking and credit unions for 20 years. And when he worked for a major national bank, employees were assets. Mm-hmm. The, and it, the best way to make money was to make sure that your assets did not cost too much money. And that mm-hmm. included employees. I mean, they literally were disposable parts of the business. Mm-hmm. That is an 80s mindset. No, you weren't around in, well, I guess you were born in the late 80s. Yeah. So you were both 88 <laughs> because you were born a year before I got married. I only know that because I just had an anniversary, so I could do the math. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like we need to go back to companies need to be loyal to employees to foster loyalty to the company. If you don't feel mm-hmm. like your company gives a you know, rat's putt, but why would you care about them? Mm-hmm. You're going to go do what you need to do and get what you can get and mm-hmm. call it a day. And that just, mm-hmm. I've always felt like that was just a really, a very cut your nose off to spite your face kind of policy. Mm-hmm. Again, work for myself. So it's like, yeah, there's a reason that I'm self-employed because I don't do corporate. 
I've just mm. not been that kind. I'm not wired that way. Never have mm-hmm. been. I did work corporate for a little while. Didn't go so well. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it is just, you know, there's different flavors for all of us. Yeah. But yeah, we need to get back to, you know, if you want to build, and I'm assuming that your your company must at least embrace this somewhat is like, if we want to build a really quality team and and do what we our mission is to do well, then we have to invest in our people and we have to treat them with respect. And, you know, you're not a widget. You're somebody that's got ideas and thoughts and passions and yeah, give them all to me. You know? <laughs> so not just go do these things on this list and shut up and go do. Yeah, I, I never did understand that one. because That's why I didn't survive in the corporate world. Cause I would question, why are we doing it like this? It makes no sense. And I didn't respond too well because that's how we do it. So, <laughs> but anyway, so we need, we need a, a shift in our societal thinking. And I, I think it's going to happen kind of like the pandemic happened with, you know, employees can actually be productive while working at home. That was not a thing prior yeah. to 2020. Yeah. You know, you had your digital nomads, your content creator type peoples that could do it. But for the most part, Mm-hmm. Most people had to go into an office every day. Mm-hmm. And now there's companies that are doing everything they can to get people back. Oh, it's awful. I mean, the reality is our office has been empty since the pandemic started. And even with the option to go back, right, like people are there for whatever the thing is and then they leave. Right. It doesn't make we waste time commuting. Like I think the the false sense of community by just being in the office, we've been able to create that in different ways. And so part of me is just like, gosh, now that we've cut out this major expense, how about we invest that money back into people? <laughs> That's a great. radical thought. Well, mm-hmm. the one thing that, and I can't speak to this because, again, I don't play corporate, is they feel like younger employees are not getting the benefit from um, mentorship. Hmm. And I can sort of see that, especially, you know, <sighs> I think we have definitely a gendered race. I don't want, I'm not sure what the right words are, but the, our mentorships are definitely geared more to white men and then maybe men in general, and then maybe white women. And then maybe the rest of you guys, it's like, again, I have not been in the corporate world since 1991. So my, uh, my viewpoint is probably a little skewed, but that one kind of makes sense, but I would think that they could do other things other than having an expensive office in downtown San Francisco, or I know you're in Virginia. I can't, but Charlottesville, I know that's DC, university you could town. Take DC, uh, you could take Washington, D.C., Richmond. Yeah, I'm sure D.C. is a real cheap place to rent an office. <laughs> yeah. San Francisco is getting a little more affordable because nobody wanted to go back. But, yeah. you know, I guess I could see that, but I like your thought better. It's like, let's... Let's figure out how to foster the community, the mentorship, et cetera, outside of a physical building so mm-hmm. we can invest that money in the team, you know, and the business. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a lot of money to invest in a lot of places. So absolutely. You know, this your mentorship point, I can I touch on it for a second? I oh, do definitely. think that like I'm a millennial. I um and of course, you know, after me, it's the Gen Z generation, right? Like technology is our friend. And so yeah, your life men- <laughs> mentorship in the office is like the lowest thing on the totem pole, to be honest. Right. Like I actually think that if I want to find someone to help guide me through something, it's just two clicks of a button and like, let me navigate LinkedIn and connect with someone. Right. Like, or, you know, let me follow up with someone that I did meet in person and then continue a conversation virtually. And so that's become the norm for me and people above and below me in generations that like um, leveraging an office or expecting my workplace to be the only place where I get mentorship is actually short-sighted. And I think if companies think that that is their greatest value add, they're not thinking about the realities of what people have access to now. Like I've, I've got, the world is my oyster. It's at my fingertips, you know? And so- That's true. What's the, what's, what's my, what's my company's greatest value add to me? It's not that. Okay. So that's really cool to know. Cause I have talked to people all over the world. I've talked to a gal from the Netherlands. 
of general and expat in Israel. Several guests have been in the UK. I have not ventured down under because Lord <laughs> knows that time difference is really tricky. The UK and Israel was nine hours ahead, so that was enough. You know, that's just a whole day in in reality, but. You know, and I've met now some of these people that I know as my quote internet friends. I've actually met in person. It's like, oh look, you have legs. This is cool. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like <laughs> it's kind of wild coming from somebody who graduated from high school in 1984. I will just say it now. I am not a baby boomer. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I had to get a special exception to be one of the experts for babyboomer.org. <clears throat> They didn't want to ask and I didn't want to tell them, but because like I don't and I don't tell them that I'm proudly not a boomer, but that's OK. Um, you know, technology was just starting when I was a teenager. It was interesting. You know, my husband grew up in Cupertino and so their computer club when he was in high school actually had Steve Jobs as an advisor. So, you know, kind of wild times back in those days. But, yeah, it's like yeah, that make, you make a really good point that that's. That's not necessarily a very good value add. So let's let's hope that we're giving caregivers that are in your position maybe a little bit of uh, we're, we're maybe reducing their fear about talking about this and basically just saying what you just said. Like you know, if I want a mentor, I can go to LinkedIn or da da da. da what you just said, they can repeat what you said verbatim and maybe have a different impact because. That wasn't a thing when I was when I graduated from college. That was not a thing. You had to have an internship and you had to know people and all that BS. <laughs> it was a totally different world. So shifting slightly, you've been on leave for a little while. You this had a week meeting. Six. <laughs> it's going quick, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> too quick. But you had a meeting the other day and you realized how stressed you got just with this meeting. You don't have to discuss what the meeting was, but. I want to kind of touch on how you've navigated or how you think you navigated both worlds and the stress, especially when you were flying back and back and forth, because stress is poison to our brains. And it's something that all of us caregivers deal with every day. So what was your um, epiphany with this meeting? <laughs> yeah. So I just had one meeting and I'm still on leave. So it was one meeting that I agreed to that I set up. Um, and it, the meeting, I'll be clear, is not the thing that stressed me. Um, it was the fact that my time on the front end before that meeting got really, really crunched. Um, and I, instead of like acknowledging that Jessica, you didn't give yourself enough time. Jessica, you actually got up too late to bathe your mother the way that you normally do, feed her for the 45 minutes, do all the things. You ended up rushing and like getting frazzled in that rushing process, which then meant I ended up being really short and snappy with my mom's music therapist because she was late. And then also was like, annoying me. And I was like, Jessica, she not, she's a music therapist. She has no reason to annoy you, but why are you getting annoyed by this woman? You know, um, my mom, I only had 20 minutes to feed her. So did I get through her typical breakfast routine? No. Like I was snappy with my mom when she wasn't cooperating. I was like, where is this coming from? And it's because I was, I was trying to fit everything before this 11 o'clock start time and didn't have enough time to do it. But instead of just being like, let me just pause. What can I do? Nothing can be, I can be late to this meeting, right? I could also say, hey, this time doesn't work for me anymore, but I didn't do that. I created this false sense of needing to be in this place right now. Therefore, my brain, everything switched into like snappy, stressed out mode. And I was able to see that experience or that just like switch for me because I had this time to reflect on the back end because I'm still on leave. And it just made me think like, holy moly, Jessica, during your work week, you were, you know, starting meetings at 10 a.m. You were feeding your mom, then running to a Zoom meeting back to back to back. And so when I reflect, I was like, OK, who actually lost in this situation? And it was my mom, like the number of times that like I 
sat on Zoom versus being present with her or like was quick and short with her because I was too busy. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. I don't like this person that I've become. I don't like this. So that's like my most recent epiphany. Um, and the epiphany here is that I can control that. No, no, no boss, no, no business, no corporation did that to Jessica, but Jessica. And so now I'm just like, okay, so you need to be even more clear about your boundaries of how many meetings you can have in a day. Um, How much time do you need pre and post a meeting to make sure that you can get time for yourself and like effectively do your routines with your mom. Um, But then also Jessica reminder, like you're the boss. So like, you could have easily just said, hey, I'm running 20 minutes behind. Can we start at this time? And so don't forget to speak up for yourself, whether you're the boss or not, but like say the thing that you need. Um, and so that was my takeaway from that. But you asked me initially, like, so part of my story for your listeners is that I was a long distance caregiver for about four years of this journey. And that meant that I was living and working in Dallas, Texas. My mother was in Virginia. And, you know, when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, it's slow yet very fast. And so for the early years, my mother was able to be in the home by herself to like still follow directions, take care of herself. So I was able to be away from her, yet I was so clicked in, whether it was checking the ring camera every 10 minutes, whether it was calling home every 30 minutes to make sure she was following the systems we had in place, Um, in between meetings, heck, during meetings, pulling up the camera to see who was at the door. And so I would honestly say, the, this entire journey, but especially the first four years of this, I was living in a constant state of stress, a constant or a heightened, a heightened sense of like awareness because it was like, oh my gosh, I've got to have all eyes on her and I'm thousands of miles away. But that was just what I thought I needed to do. It was how I made it work. It was how I thought I needed to be present in both places, you know? Yeah. And I, I marvel that that worked for you because my mother would not have put up with any quote systems. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when I'm on social media and I see some people's loved ones that are just so compliant, I, I have to resist the, you're very lucky because my mother would have told you to mm, bleep bloop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is a clean podcast. So I'm not going to repeat what my mother would have said. My mom wasn't too profane, but when you pissed her off, yeah. I mean, one of her last statements to me was, please drop dead. <laughs> so, you know, she was mad at me because I wanted to, she would walk behind me. There was nothing I could do to fix that, to make, keep her safe by having walking elbow and elbow or have her walk next to me or slightly ahead of me. And I know why they don't want to walk next to you because they don't have peripheral vision. They can't see you. If they, they can't see you if you're walking, if they're walking in front of you. And it wasn't until, I think it was this year, actually, 2022, that one of my guests said, wait, 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 didn't you say your mom was the oldest of four? And I said, yeah, she was walking behind me so she could keep an eye on all the kids. And I'm like, well, I wish I'd known that then because it would make me nuts because she also watched her feet. And there was some times that she would bend over just enough that I thought it's it's only going to take a slight shift of something. And she's going to land on her face on the sidewalk. And I'm going to be the, you know, dirtbag daughter that didn't care enough because she's traveling behind me. And if I slowed down, she'd slow down. If I, oh God, it was just, it was not fun. And so this one particular day, I was just like, oh, I forgot what excuse I made, but I got her to walk elbow and elbow with me. And we got to a point where she just, it's like, I think she forgot my excuse and she was irritated. She didn't want to do that. And I'm like, but I feel safer if you let me hold your arm, you know, I, that way I know that you're going to take care of me. So, I mean, I wasn't even going there with her, like, you need me to do this so you don't fall on your face or whatever. And she jerks her arm out of my elbow and goes, just drop dead. (laughs) So, yeah, my mom was not easy. (laughs) She got harder as she, the closer she got to the end of life, harder she got. So it's, it's interesting to me to watch your story and other people's stories on Instagram because it's like, oh, they're so lucky because my mother would have told you to go pound salt. That's that's how and then that's kind of how she was all her life. So it's not it wasn't unusual, but it made it a lot harder. But how did you 
navigate the stress? Did you navigate the stress those first four years? Or are you now realizing that it's going to take you a couple years to get, come, <laughs> bring the heart rate down to a normal level for an extended uh, period of time? Yeah. Well, okay. So I think, um, there's, it's like a both and so like on one hand, um, like the go, go, go mode, like the being the high stress, the being, you know, really just hyper vigilant around all the things that I needed, needed to do or could do was what kept me going. Right. Like I, there were no answers. There was no guidebook. There was like no one telling me what to do. And so I actually used some of that energy to like help me navigate every new problem that was popping up every day. Right. And then on the other hand, my way of um, uh, addressing my stress, but just like creating the opposite of stress was creating a really disciplined life for myself. And so you often see like a lot of meal prep for my mother that didn't start because of her. Like I was an intense disciplined meal prep meal prepper for myself. Um, I was like unwavering about going to the gym every single day. Like boot camp at six 30 was what I did because it was predictable and allowed me to get out my stress. That was a thing for me. Right. Um, <laughs> It's just the 6.30. I've done boot camp, but oh, 6.30. No, no. Oh, p.m., <laughs> not a.m. Oh, the okay. Uh, 6.30 p.m. <laughs> I prefer morning workouts, but after breakfast, and I don't generally get up till 7, so yeah. there is no 6.30 a.m. <laughs> other than the dog laying on my chest. Exactly. Because he wants attention. So, okay. Yeah. No, boot camp is great, and and exercise does help keep the stress level down. Yeah. So, it was like discipline exercise regimen, discipline meal prep. Um, I also, you know, I'm an only child and I'm also pretty much an introvert. I know this about myself. And so I was okay not socializing or engaging with other people at times to recharge my batteries. And so whether that was reading books, watching movies, you know, just being in my home by myself was actually just helpful for me to reset every week. And then to be honest, while my job was a really big job, I spent a lot of time pouring into my work, even in the early years, because it was a distraction from the realities of how stressful and unknown caregiving was. So I think that's actually maybe the lesson here is like I spent time creating like habits of things that I knew, like creating things that I like I could say are known things because my life was so like uncontrollable when it came to all the things I did not know and the unknown of how Alzheimer's was going to impact my mother that day, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you, so did you move back home because of the pandemic? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I moved the year before the pandemic and that was a whole situation. And I remember like making the big decision to say, Jessica, why are you traveling from Texas to Virginia when you're just leaving an empty apartment? Like you can home can be your home base. And then you just travel back and forth to Texas. So I finally came to terms with that, which was like such a big moment for me, because at that point, you know, I'm like, I'm giving up my life. My friends, my job is here. Like my identity was in Texas. And I'll never forget having to turn my keys into my apartment and just like 
like I gave the lady my keys and then I just started sobbing and she was like are you okay and I was like <laughs> I just closed a major chapter you know like I just like it felt like so much was ending and I was also so consumed with where my mom was at so she had at this point when I moved back in 2019 my mom was wandering she was bolting out the door across the street like my neighbors were unhappy it was like I I had no choice but to come back home but I didn't at the time see what was in this for me or what was next for me. I was moving home out of obligation of being an excellent daughter and making sure she was cared for and with dignity and respect, you know? And so I name that because at the time of me transitioning, which was March, 2019, I say all the time, like I couldn't dream. Like I could not see what was next for Jessica. I couldn't think about the year ahead. All I could see was I'm giving up so much to be a caregiver to my mom. Um, You didn't ask all that, but yes, I moved home before the pandemic. And this is important to note because I was still working for my same organization. It was in fact, my ED who was like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Go have your home base be Virginia, travel back and forth. We'll pay for one flight a month. Like it was just seamless, right? And at the time, I had spent so much time thinking like, oh my gosh, my team won't understand me. I'm not proximate to the community anymore. I'm not here in person. Like, woe is me. And then literally a year later, the pandemic happens. I'm like, oh my gosh, welcome. I'm not so alone. (laughs) Y'all get it? Like, Welcome to my world. Oh, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, you said I didn't ask about some of that, but you make a really good point. Like you could not see... Like what next week was going to look like for Jessica of 2019 or next month or next year. Like, I'm sure you didn't predict March of 2020. (laughs) If you did, you didn't warn the rest of us. But, (laughs) um, and I think that's what happens. Like people, they don't see an option. There aren't many options anyway, even if you kind of run the short list of options. And they, they do give up a lot, but Mm -hmm. they don't. I think I I see a lot of people that they just, they get stuck in that woe is me. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I think part of it is because they're older and they had different designs on their life and it's difficult to be semi-retired and travel when you're stuck taking care of a a loved one. Um, How did you get out of that, that feeling of, you know, I've given up all my life for this Mm -hmm. And especially with, you know, your mom, like mine was very, is young, um, youngish anyway, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's like, I expected my mom to live past 77. I really did. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons there was, there was no way she could have lived with me. That was not a situation that would have worked (laughs) mostly because she was not at all cooperative. And I, I only have, my husband's an only child. I have one child like a lot of only children in my life. I'm also an introvert. I'm like, I can't, I've had my mom for like for four or five days at a time. I'm like, this is not going to work. And she had enough money to move to memory care. But I was like, I'm not giving up. I had just turned 50. I'm like, I am not giving up the next 15 years of my life mm. because I don't know what it'll, what I'm, what life will be like when I'm in my sixties. I still don't know what life will be like when I'm in my sixties. Thank you very much. It's <laughs> <laughs> a little closer now. And, you know, but it's, I, I was lucky enough to be able to make that decision for us. And my mom thrived in memory care because she had friends and I have all kinds of funny stories about that, but people have heard those before. So how did you get past that? Woe is me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't like, I'm assuming there was in the dark moments, you didn't really see a very good future for yourself. Yeah. I think in the darkest of moments, it was like, Oh, I don't want to do this. Like, you know, I think that that it, it was like, I didn't ask for this. I think there was a, there was definitely like a resentful dark stage where it was like, people choose to have kids. I don't want to have, I don't want to be a caregiver. Like it was, I was, I was, I was angry at the things that I couldn't do. I was angry at the fact that I didn't have a choice. This was like, plop down on me right I got over that it, I mean that was that was a phase right but like we were in it um I would also say in that moment of the dark space of not being able to dream 
and like thinking that my life was over clearly was short-sighted and clearly I was wrapped up in a lot of just like grief of like things changing for us and honestly the first few months home like being home like waking up being here with my mother not having to like hop on a plane in two weeks to, to to be gone you know being able to slow down and see my mom for all the quirks, for all the things that she did, it gave me a new appreciation for her. And so I think actually being here, being more present, being able to truly like slow down and take care of her, I saw the blessing in disguise of this choice that I was making. And I quickly realized, I was like, oh, my life isn't ending. I'm actually able to see a new side of my mom that I never saw because I was always go, go, go. Um, I was always like, okay, cool. System this, meal prep this, doctor this, go. And like, I never saw CG. And so slowing down, moving back home got me out of that rut of not knowing what was next. Did I know what my next like career step professional move was going to be? No. But did I know that I was in the right place at the right time? Absolutely. Um, was I grateful for the fact that we were able to create those memories and do the things that we did? Absolutely. Um, and that's because I made the choice to shift. And so I, I look back now and think, gosh, 2019, March 2019, through the pandemic, while it was tough at times, probably made me appreciate the fact that I got to be a caregiver of my mom during that time. That I got to see, even as she was losing so much, how much she still had, right? Um, and that that's what brought me through that, for sure. And the reason I ask that is because I see a lot of people that seem stuck. Now, maybe it's just a moment, you know, we're talking social media or, you know, during the support groups that I've been in and now facilitate people seem stuck and I'm mm -hmm. trying to help people get unstuck. And I've been mm -hmm. there, you know, April of 2021, my mom was gone. My paternal grandmother was gone. I basically had no obligations to any older family members. And of course we were still kind of sitting at home with not much to do because everybody <laughs> was still getting vaccinated at that point. And my husband looked at me and he goes, you can do whatever you want. And my first reaction was to go into panic mode that I didn't know what I wanted. And I had, and I put a deadline on it. I was like, whoa, back up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. like, who says I got to decide what I want to do with the rest of my life? My whatever it was like 48 years at that point, mm -hmm. 49 years of life that I'm planning on. Who says I got to decide that by the time I turned 55, which is mm -hmm. I turned 55 last year. I'm like, as soon as I took away that self-imposed deadline, it was like, cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I lived in the same county all of those 55 years. And then a month after my birthday, we moved to two hours north to a different part of California, not leaving California. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband's from New York. He knows we're not leaving here. <laughs> <laughs> He's lucky he got me out of the county we lived in. But we, and I, I, this might sound weird. We were brave enough to say, wait a minute. There are other options out there because what we yeah. wanted to do in our hometown wasn't panning out because real estate went <laughs> berserk pricing and what we wanted to do, it just, it wasn't working out. Like yep. we were trying to fit, you know, the square peg in the round hole just was not working. And our best friends had told us early in 21 that they were going to move to this area. And I was like, I was devastated. I was like, like, we're not even done with this pandemic crap. I haven't even like re, re, reconstituted the social life and now you're leaving us <laughs> and so you know a couple months later when he's like you can do whatever you want we went on a three-week road trip we came back we're like let's let's explore the area that they're moving to and then we ended up moving before them by like six months oh wow and it's like there's times when i think why did my parents not ever do this why did my dad's parents my dad's parents lived on a lake but they lived in a suburb suburb of San Francisco, and it it's definitely not the the it neighborhood it used to be. And I'm like, if they had just come up here and seen this community, they would have said bye, and <laughs> poof, they would have been gone. Mm. And you know, it was just like sometimes you just have to be like, 
what's the worst that could happen? We move up here, we buy a house, we fix it up a little bit. We decide, geez, we really hate it up here. Do yeah. you sell it and do something else? Like there, there are very few decisions in life that are truly life and death. Yeah. And mm. go ahead. Mm-hmm. Learning I that just, helps. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I think that's actually the key to getting unstuck. I think, uh, re- yes, being with my mom, being proximate, all those things, but then also like realizing that this wasn't the end. Jessica, your mother was still functioning. She was still walking. She's still a personality. Jessica, your life is not over, right? Like I still traveled. I still like was with friends. Like I was still able to take advantage of opportunities. And so I think it's the, it's the, it's the thing your husband said. It's like, you can do whatever you want, right? Whether your loved one is past or still here, life is not over. The question is, are you going to choose to live life while you are navigating this caregiving experience? And yes, you will. I had to make some adjustments. Yes, there were things way more difficult to get out the house. Yeah. However, that didn't stop us from going to the movies or going to the mall. You know what I mean? Like doing things that brought me joy and my mom joy. And I think that also helped me realize that like, my road isn't over. I can still dream. It just might, the journey might look a little different, which I think goes to your other point you were naming is like, at the time I was what, 31, 32, 31, 32. And it was, uh, I was watching friends of mine get married, have kids, have amazing investment portfolios, travel the world. You know what I mean? Like just pick up and go. And I had to, to release the idea that I had to be a certain place by you know, 34 years old, I, I had to be, you know, able to do these things or release the, the, what at the time with jealousy, the resentment that I couldn't do those things it, and, and the way that they were doing them. But it does not mean that I still don't, you know, get a chance to, to engage in the way that they are. I think, you know, I've also had to face the fact that like, um, no one put those limits on me, but Jessica, and so, therefore, I can release those limits. The question is, do I want to? And you have to want to realize that there's something more than your current situation of caregiving in order to move through it, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, and I don't know if you know this. I do talk about it, but not a ton. My mom was the third generation with some form of dementia. Her mm-hmm. mom had vascular and or mixed dementia, and my maternal great grandmother also had dementia. So <laughs> yay for my family history. <laughs> um, but it, in some ways it's like, I kind of knew what to expect with my mom because it's seen it with my grandmother, which helped because I also knew I wasn't willing to go there, mm-hmm. but I wasn't going to abandon her. Mm-hmm. And I do have a sister, all that. That's a whole other story. And like, <sighs> Just because you have siblings or family doesn't necessarily mean they're going to help. Mm-hmm. So sometimes your situation sounds extraordinarily difficult because you don't really have anybody to lean on on a daily basis. Sometimes you still don't have those people to lean on, even if they're in your life. So mm. ugh, it's not fun. But anyway, um, you know, it's like I could look at the situation and say, this is what I can do. And I did what I could. I took my mom to the park to watch kids. It got more and more difficult. As I mentioned, she didn't like to walk next to me. I was always terrified. She was going to face plant on the ground and people were going to yell at me and it was going to be a whole thing. But once we got to a bench and she was, you know, she just loved to watch the kids. I hope Mm -hmm. the dogs aren't going to bark anymore. Um, But I see so many people that just, it's like they stop thinking about what things like could be in the future and Mm -hmm. how you get there. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. somehow like I am, even with a GPS, I'm so navigated. I am so directionally challenged. It's very sad. I'm leaving the County that I lived in where there was a mountain in the West. Like, Oh, that's West because the mountains over there. Very easy to navigate, (laughs) but it's, you know, it's sometimes you just get lost and you're like, well, crap, I'm lost. Mm -hmm. I will just figure out how to get back. And Mm -hmm. I did that when I went to Chicago, I was riding one of those rental bikes that was crappy and I was very hot and I did not have sunscreen on and I was lost. And I'm like, this is not fun. And I'm like, I know that the husband is probably watching on the, you know, find my phone tracker. He likes to do that. 
And I'm like, that's fine. I'm in Chicago. I've never been to Chicago. I'm just going to like figure out how to get back to the hotel and enjoy what I see on my way back. The, um, crap. Was it Lilith, Lilith Fair? No. Forgot what the big music festival was. You could tell I'm getting old because I totally <laughs> forgot what big Lilith music. Fair. That, that took you back. Lilith yeah, Fair. but it was, it was, oh crap. It was, it'll pop into my head after we're done recording. But anyway, so there was a lot of very young people in very little amount of clothing. I was like, dang, I must be getting old because like the judginess is coming out on these outfits. <laughs> but it was just like, I just got to experience something totally different. And mm -hmm. I could have freaked out that I was lost. I could have called my husband like, oh my God. I'm like, I can get back to the hotel. I've got money. Mm -hmm. I can get Uber, you know, if they can figure out where to pick me up. That was one of my problems. There was so many people. This one Uber driver literally drove past me twice and then canceled my, my ride. <laughs> that was fun. <sighs> I'm like, so I had to figure out how to get out of the crowd so I could get back to a place where like a driver could actually like find me, mm -hmm. which was, tr you know, tricky in downtown Chicago with this giant music festival and thousands of people everywhere. But I kind of panicked and I could have just like, I know people are just gonna think I'm so stupid because I blow up like, no, no, we're just going to enjoy exploring and we will eventually not be lost. And that's mm. kind of how I wish caregivers would kind of see this journey. It's like, yeah, you were mm. totally not on the path that you planned on, that you could envision, that you mm. want to be on, mm -hmm. but you're there, mm -hmm. you know, unless the pterodactyl comes and picks you up and moves you somewhere or you beam up, <laughs> beam me over here, Scotty. I'm like really dating myself now. <laughs> you got to you got to figure out how to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And I that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about your story, because I'm like, there are days when I watch your Instagram stories and I think, God, I don't know how this girl is mad at it. I'm exhausted just listening to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's that though. It's the it's the I'm truly just taking it day by day. And I know that each day I have to show up for my mom. And I'm not gonna half ass it when I show up for her. I wanna make sure she has the best day possible. She's on she's currently on hospice, right? Like she's in the last stage of Alzheimer's disease. Like I wanna make sure that she gets um, to have joy. She gets to feel pampered, whether it's, you know, my caregiver giving her a hand massage or whatever it might be. And so I think there are exhausting days, but I know that those exhausting days are numbered. And so let me, I'm I'm truly, I don't know if I would say the word enjoy, but I am in this moment. <laughs> Of, of navigating this chapter. And I know that this chapter is going to end one day and then I can, I can continue writing my story after it, but I'm going to be the best writer of this chapter possible. Um, no matter how exhausted it makes me. Um, but just because I'm exhausted does not mean I don't have the things in place to restore. And I think especially social media, everyone's talking about self-care, but we don't always have to publicize what we do to make sure we show up well. And I think that that is, that's the thing that keeps people in this is like, do you have the things to restore you in whatever way that looks? Um, I think, I think I've finally struck the balance of the things that I need to be able to show up well for my mom and for myself. Well, that's a great place to end because yeah. <laughs> I want everybody to think about what, it, where, how you can get to that same spot how you can balance your needs and your loved one's needs. I mean, obviously it's not 50, 50 every day. Sometimes mm -hmm. your mom needs more and sometimes you can have a little more mm -hmm. and that's typical life, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the ba the word balance, that's the thing. I know you're trying to end it. Sorry. It's, it's never, okay. 50. <laughs> it's never, it's never like equal part. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as you realize that it's not equal part, you release the expectation of like, Am I well balanced? It's actually like, no, where's your energy? What's the give and take? And that might look different from day to day. As long as it equals, you know, to a hundred down the road, that's fine. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And that was one of the reasons I took my mom to the park. It gave her joy. It was a challenge to get her in the car, out of the car, to the bench. But then once we did it, I could take a few minutes and either answer emails or if I just mm -hmm. needed to like chill, I could put my head back and let the, you know, the sun you know, warm my face or listen, you know, I would listen. I'm like, yes, I have a daughter. I am not a huge child. Like kids are not like my big thing, <laughs> yeah, which my daughter knows with this. This is not a secret in our family or anything. It's not that I don't like children. It's just, I'm not one of those like kid freaky moms. I don't know mm -hmm. what the right term is anyway. 
But I would listen to him like shrieking and laughing. And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, it's like such innocence and joy and just such simple pleasures. Mm. You could listen to them be kids and appreciate the simple parts of life. Mm-hmm. And then and my mom being happy and being out in the sunlight really benefited her. I don't know how many other people could see it. And, you know, it's possible, but not likely that I was imagining it. But she always seemed just like a little bit brighter after we'd been mm. outside for a bit. Mm -hmm. And I attribute that to getting out, being in this nature, being in fresh air, sunlight, Mm -hmm. children laughing. I mean, like, why wouldn't that restore somebody's soul? (laughs) Absolutely. So do you know what's coming next? Have you thought much about that or what the after? Mm -hmm. Yeah. After caregiving, I think, (laughs) you know, um, obviously I still have my job. I am grateful and love my job. And I also, there is an expiration date on my job. And so I, I know that that's coming. And so I've been really thinking about how does Jessica want to spend her time? What brings me joy? And I think the thing that brings me joy is um, advocating for and creating space to support other young millennial caregivers, especially. I think you alluded to this at the beginning of your show of just like, we are about to hit a time where people are about to be hit with being caregivers and have no idea it's coming. Um, And so there's both the, how do we help equip people um, to navigate this? Because let's be honest, the majority of caregivers my age are not married, not living in a white picket fence and do not have the structure set up to help them do as like the movies do when it comes to caregiving. So like, how do we help people like me navigate? Um, I also want to leverage my experiences to help Um, some of these organizations and companies that I've had to navigate when it comes to home health and hospice and medical um, (laughs) offices, just be better. Um, How do we be better for family caregivers? Because the thing that creates the greatest barriers and frustrations for family caregivers are the very systems that are set up to help us. And that's not okay. Um, That's probably a whole nother podcast episode (laughs) in itself, but gosh, we've got to do better. And I've learned some really hard lessons and I would love to help companies and orgs improve. So that's what I'm really ideating on. It's not put together yet, but that's what gives me joy and energy and where I want to spend my time. Well, after you'll have more, you know, there'll be a period of time, but you'll have, you'll have more energy. It'll all happen. It's all marinating in the background. Like I get ideas and sometimes they don't, I don't even mention them until they're almost fully formed. Like I have an entire book written in my head and I got to get back to it Um, because, you know, I had a unique experience with my mom and losing her during the pandemic and everything, you know, it's like, it's been different Mm -hmm. and it's not, please let's not have that experience again, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and I had it better than a lot of family caregivers who could not go see their loved ones. I mean, Mm -hmm. I didn't see my mom the last two weeks of her life. I did see Mm. her the day before and the, well, I saw her the day of, but she was already gone. And I agree with you about, you know, we need to train people, you know, that there's a whole caregiving chunk of the medical system our healthcare system for lack of a better term that we need to just change dramatically and immediately and hopefully mm-hmm. hopefully it'll it will happen i don't know that it will happen in the next 47 years of my life so <laughs> <laughs> and please i really don't want to have to live too much past 103 people <laughs> okay let's just let's just fix this so get it together get it together yeah it's like it's not that hard really it's like I think people aren't thinking about it and they're overthinking it and, and they're relying on very old school thought processes. Like, you know, doctors aren't trained on Alzheimer's and dementias. They get like four hours in two years or four years. It's ridiculous, Mm -hmm. but you're right. That's a whole other episode that we can do (laughs) some other day. (laughs) I really appreciate this. And I really feel like what you're teaching people is helpful. I especially like how you, you talk about representation and mm-hmm. I do keep that in mind. I have an ep- uh, episode that'll come out before this one where we talk about this gal wrote, she's written books for, um, BIPOC children mm. because she didn't even see that represented in, she's in Canada in the Alzheimer's society. All she saw were white people. So she mm-hmm. didn't think black people got Alzheimer's. 
mm-hmm. and she didn't see people like herself there. Mm-hmm. And that's like a huge thing. It's like, you know, it's important. Mm-hmm. And I've learned from people like you about representation. So you're, you're making a mark somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're I welcome. do want to make one correction. My uh-huh. Instagram is career caregiving collide. I was wondering if I got the, I get them backwards. <laughs> it's because it's all one long phrase. Yeah. <laughs> but I will make sure that her Instagram link is in the show notes so that you guys can all follow her because she gives lots of good advice, and then there's days when there's some good smackdown that many of us need. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when it's like, uh-oh, Jessica's on that ranch again. I'm yeah. like, sometimes I feel like messaging going, yes, yes, I got it. Presentation. Yeah. I do the best I can, okay? <laughs> but I, I just, I you leave you alone. <laughs> there's others that haven't gotten it yet, though. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on them together, so... Yeah. Anywho, well, thank you, and I know we will be in touch because we've. This is not the first time Jessica and I have talked. Just the first official one for you guys. Yes. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>